Joseph James Rogan, born August 11th, 1967, is an American podcaster, Ultimate Fighting Championship, UFC, color commentator, comedian, actor, and former television presenter. He hosts The Joe Rogan Experience, a podcast in which he discusses current events, comedy, politics, philosophy, science, and hobbies with a variety of guests. Rogan was born in Newark, New Jersey, and began his career in comedy in August 1988 in the Boston area. After relocating to Los Angeles in 1994, he signed an exclusive development deal with Disney and appeared as an actor on several television shows, including Hardball and News Radio. In 1997, he started working for the UFC as an interviewer and color commentator. He released his first comedy special, I'm Gonna Be Dead Someday, in 2000, and hosted the game show Fear Factor for from 2001 to 2006. After leaving Fear Factor, Rogan focused on his stand-up career and hosted more comedy specials. He launched the Joe Rogan Experience in 2009. By 2015, it was one of the most popular podcasts in the world, regularly receiving millions of plays per episode. Spotify obtained exclusive distribution rights to the Joe Rogan Experience in 2020 for $100 million. Now, I hope they cite the source somewhere there because that's been debated or speculated upon, right? Early life. Joseph James Rogan was born on August 11th, 1967 in Newark, New Jersey, U.S. He is of three quarters Italian and one quarter Irish descent. His father, Joseph, is a former police officer in Newark. Rogan's parents divorced when he was five, and he has not been in contact with his father since he was seven. Rogan recalled, All I remember of my dad are these brief, violent flashes of domestic violence, but I don't want to complain about my childhood. Nothing bad ever really happened to me. I don't hate the guy. From ages 7 to 11, he lived in San Francisco, California, after which his family moved to Gainesville, Florida. They later settled in Newton Upper Falls, Massachusetts, outside Boston, where Rogan attended Newton South High School, from which he graduated in 1985. Rogan participated in Little League Baseball and developed an interest in martial arts in his early teens. He recalled being terrified of being a loser as a child, in quotes, and martial arts, quote, gave me not just confidence, but also a different perspective of myself and what I was capable of. I knew that I could do something I was terrified of and that was really difficult and that I could excel at it. It was a big deal for me. Martial arts were the first thing that ever gave me hope that I wasn't going to be a loser, so I really, really gravitated toward it. At age 14, Rogan took up karate and a year later started Taekwondo. When he was 19, he won the U.S. Open Championship Taekwondo Tournament as a lightweight. He was a Massachusetts full-contact state champion for four consecutive years and became a Taekwondo instructor. Rogan also practiced amateur kickboxing and held a 2-1 and one record. He retired from competition at age 21 as he began to suffer from frequent headaches and feared he might sustain worse injuries. He attended the University of Massachusetts Boston but found it pointless and dropped out early. He lived in the Boston area until he was 24. His career, 1988 to 1994, early stand-up career. Rogan had no intention of being a professional stand-up comedian and initially considered a career in kickboxing. He was a fan of comedy from a young age, and comedian Richard Pryor's film Live on the Sunset Strip affected him in, quote, such a profound way. Nothing had made me laugh like that. Rogan's friends from gym and taekwondo school, whom he would make laugh with impressions and jokes, convinced him to have a go at stand-up comedy. At 21, after six months preparing material and practicing his delivery, he performed his first stand-up routine on August 27, 1988, at an open mic night at Stitches Comedy Club in Boston. While living in Boston and working on his stand-up, Rogan held several jobs to secure himself financially, including teaching martial arts at Boston University and in Revere, Massachusetts, delivering newspapers, driving a limousine, doing construction work, and performing duties for a private investigator. 
Meanwhile, his blue comedy style earned him gigs at bachelor parties and strip clubs. One night, Rogan persuaded the owner of a comedy club in Boston to allow him to try a new five-minute routine. At the show was talent manager Jeff Sussman, who liked Rogan's act and offered to become his manager. Rogan accepted Sussman's offer. In 1990, Rogan moved to New York City as a full-time comedian. He was scratching and grinding for money and stayed with his grandfather in Newark for the first six months. Rogan later cited Richard Jenny, Lenny Bruce, Sam Kinison, and Bill Hicks as comedy influences. 94 to 99, Hardball and News Radio. In 1994, Rogan relocated to Los Angeles, where his first national television spot followed on the MTV comedy show Half Hour Comedy Hour. The appearance led to the networks offering him a three-year exclusive contract and a role in a pilot episode of a dopey game show, in quotes, for $500. Rogan declined, but it prompted Sussman to send tapes of Rogan's performances to several networks, which sparked a bidding war. After a period of negotiation, Rogan accepted a development deal with Disney Network. He secured his first major acting role in the 1994 nine-episode Fox sitcom Hardball as Frank Valente, a young egocentric star player on a professional baseball team. Rogan called the hiring process weird as the network had no idea if he could act until he was asked by Dean Valentine, then president of Walt Disney Television, to whom he replied, if you can lie, you can act. And if you can lie to crazy girlfriends, you can act under pressure. The filming schedule was a new experience for Rogan, who started to work 12-hour days. Rogan later said it was a great show on paper until a horrible executive producer with a big ego was hired by Fox to run the show and he rewrote it. Around this time, Rogan began performing at the Comedy Store in Hollywood and was hired as a paid regular by owner Mitzi Shore. He performed at the club for the next 13 years for free and paid for the venue's new sound system. From 1995 to 1999, Rogan starred in the NBC sitcom News Radio as Joe Gorelli, an electrician and handyman at the show's fictional news radio station. The role was originally set to be played by actor Ray Romano, but Romano was let go from the cast after one rehearsal and Rogan was brought in. The switch caused Rogan to work with the show's writers to help develop the character before the show was set to launch, which he later described as a very dumbed-down, censored version of himself. Rogan befriended fellow cast member Phil Hartman, who confided his marital problems to him. Rogan claimed he tried to persuade Hartman to divorce his wife five times, but he, quote, loved his kids and didn't want to leave. In 1998, Hartman was murdered by his wife. The loss affected Rogan's ability to perform stand-up, and he canceled a week of scheduled gigs. Rogan later saw acting as an easy job, but grew tired of, quote, playing the same character every week, and only did so for the money. He later viewed his time on news radio as a dream gig that allowed him to earn money while working on his stand-up as often as he could. During the series, he worked on a pilot for a show entitled Overseas. And 97 to 2006, UFC commentator and Fear Factor. Rogan began working for the mixed martial arts promotion Ultimate Fighting Championship as a backstage and post-fight interviewer. His first show took place at UFC 12 Judgment Day in Dothan, Alabama on February 7, 1997. He became interested in Brazilian jiu-jitsu in 1994 after watching Royce Gracie, is it Royce or Hoyce, forgive me, fight at UFC 2 No Way Out and landed the position at the organization as Sussman was friends with its co-creator and original producer, Campbell McLaren. He quit after two years as his salary could not cover the cost of traveling to the events, which were often held in rural locations at the time. After the UFC was taken over by Zufa in 2001, Rogan attended some events and became friends with its new president, Dana White, who offered him a job as a color commentator. However, Rogan initially declined as he, quote, just wanted to go to the fights and drink. 
In 2002, White was able to hire Rogan for free in exchange for prime event tickets for him and his friends. After about 15 free gigs as a commentator, Rogan accepted pay for the job working alongside Mike Goldberg until the end of 2016. Rogan won the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Award for Best Television Announcer twice and was named MMA Personality of the Year four times by the World MMA Awards. In 1999, Rogan secured a three-album deal with Warner Brothers Records and began tentative plans to star in his own primetime television sitcom on Fox named The Joe Rogan Show. The show, co-written by Seinfeld writer Bill Masters, was to feature Rogan as a second-string sportscaster who lands a spot as the token male on a View-style woman's show. In December 1999, he recorded his first stand-up comedy album in two shows at the Comedy Connection at Fenewell Hall, forgive me if that's incorrect, in Boston, which was released as I'm Gonna Be Dead Someday in August 2000. It received national exposure on The Howard Stern Show and downloads from Napster. Voodoo Punani a song Rogan wrote after Warner suggested to produce a song they could play on the radio, was subsequently released as a single. Around this time, Rogan also worked on ideas for a film and a cartoon with his comedian friend Chris McGuire, and began to operate a blog on his website, JoeRogan.net, which he used to discuss various topics that helped him develop his stand-up routines. In 2001, the development of Rogan's television show was interrupted after he accepted an offer from NBC to host the American edition of Fear Factor. He declined initially as he thought the network would not air such a program due to its content, but Sussman convinced him to accept. Rogan later said that the main reason he accepted was to obtain observations and anecdotes for his stand-up comedy. The show increased Rogan's national exposure, which caused turnouts at his stand-up gigs to grow. Fear Factor ran for an additional six seasons, from 2001 to 2006. Rogan's role as a host of Fear Factor led to further television opportunities. In 2002, he appeared on the episode A Beautiful Mind of Just Shoot Me as Chris, the boyfriend of lead character Maya Gallo. In December 2002, Rogan was the MC for the 2002 blockbuster Hollywood Spectacular, A Christmas Parade in Hollywood. In February 2003, Rogan became the new co-host of The Man Show on Comedy Central for its fifth season from August 2003 with fellow comedian Doug Stanhope following the departure of original hosts Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla. A year into the show, however, the hosts entered disagreements with Comedy Central and the show's producers over content. Rogan recalled, I was a little misled. I was told, show nudity and we'll blur it out. Swear and we'll bleep it out. That hadn't been the case. The show ended in 2004. Around this time, Rogan entered talks to host his own radio show, but they came to nothing due to his already busy schedule. 2005 to 2009 comedy specials. In 2005, actor Wesley Snipes challenged Rogan to a cage fight. Rogan trained for the event for five months before Snipes backed out following an investigation by the IRS for alleged tax evasion. Rogan believed Snipes needed a quick payout to alleviate his debt. After Fear Factor, Rogan focused his career on his stand-up comedy as concentrating on television had made him feel lazy and uninspired to work on new material for his act. With the money he had earned from television, Rogan hired two people full-time to film him and his comedy friends on tour and release clips on his website for his Joe Show web series. In May 2005, Rogan signed a deal with the Endeavor Talent Agency. Two months later, he filmed his second stand-up comedy special, Joe Rogan Live in Phoenix, Arizona. The special premiered on Showtime in 2007.
In 2005, Rogan wrote a blog entry on his website accusing comedian Carlos Mencia of joke thievery, a claim he had made since 1993. The situation culminated in February 2007 when Rogan confronted Mencia on stage at the Comedy Store in Hollywood. A video of the incident was uploaded onto YouTube and included evidence and comments from other comedians, including George Lopez, the Reverend Bob Levy, I think it's Bob Levy, actually, Bobby Lee and Ari Shafir. The incident led to Rogan's talent agent expelling him as a client of the Gersh Agency, who also managed Mencia and his band from the Comedy Store, causing him to relocate his regular venue to the Hollywood Improv Comedy Club. Rogan later said that every comic he had talked to was happy and thankful that he did it and went on to sign with William Morris Agency. Rogan returned to the Comedy Store in 2013 to support Shafir in the filming of his first special. In April 2007, Comedy Central Records released Rogan's fourth comedy special, Shiny Happy Jihad. The set was recorded in September 2006 at Cobb's Comedy Club in San Francisco and contains excerpts of an improvised Q&A session with the audience that was typical of Rogan's act at the time. And I can actually confirm he did a really cool Q&A when I went to see him as well. 2009 to present, latest endeavors and podcast. Rogan hosted the short-lived CBS show Game Show in My Head, which aired for eight episodes in January 2009. It was produced by Ashton Kutcher. The show involved contestants who try to convince people to perform or take part in increasingly bizarre situations for money. He agreed to host the show as the idea intrigued him, calling it a completely mindless form of entertainment. In 2010, Rogan accused comedian Dane Cook of joke thievery. In 2011, Rogan resumed his role as Fear Factor host for its seventh and final season until 2012. Rogan took the job, saying he would hate to see somebody else do it. Later in 2011, Rogan played his first major film character, Gale, in the comedy film Zookeeper. He was also working on a book around this time that he tentatively titled Irresponsible Advice from a Man with No Credibility, based on his blog entries on his website. Rogan played himself in Here Comes the Boom, another action comedy film starring Kevin James that was released in 2012. In December 2012, Rogan released his sixth comedy special, Live from the Tabernacle, exclusively as a download on his website for $5, following Louis C.K.'s example. I should say Louis C.K., sorry about that. In 2013, Rogan hosted the television show Joe Rogan Questions Everything on the Sci-Fi Network, which aired for six episodes. The show covered topics discussed on his podcasts, including the existence of Bigfoot and UFOs, and featured several comedians experts and scientists with the aim of trying to put some subjects to bed with an open-minded perspective. Sci-Fi agreed to produce the show without a pilot episode. The production team gave Rogan some creative control over the program and aimed to present it in his own words where possible. The Joe Rogan Experience In December 2009, Rogan launched a free podcast with his friend and fellow comedian Brian Redban. The first episode was recorded on December 24th and was to be a live weekly broadcast on Ustream, with Rogan and Red Band sitting in front of laptops and bullshitting, unquote. By August 2010, the podcast was named The Joe Rogan Experience and entered the list of top 100 podcasts on iTunes and in 2011 was picked up by Sirius XM Satellite Radio. The podcast features an array of guests who discuss current events, politics, philosophy, comedy, hobbies, and numerous other topics. In January 2015, the podcast was downloaded over 11 million times. By October that year, the podcast was downloaded 16 million times each month, making it one of the most popular free podcasts. On May 19th, 2020, Rogan announced that he had signed a multi-year licensing deal with Spotify worth an estimated $100 million, making it one of the largest licensing agreements in the podcast business. The deal made the Joe Rogan experience available on Spotify starting September 1st, 2020, and exclusive on the platform from January 2021. Clips from the video version will continue to be available on YouTube, 
In February 2022, Spotify removed 113 episodes of the Joe Rogan experience over the course of a few days, owing in part to some of the episodes having been perceived to have racist and insensitive language. On it, Rogan is a co-founder of the supplements and fitness company On It, which was sold to Unilever in 2021. Rogan frequently advertises for On It products on his podcast. I did not know it was sold to Unilever. Wow. Personal life. Rogan married Jessica Ditzel, a former cocktail waitress in 2009. The couple have two daughters. The first was born in 2008 and the second in 2010. Rogan is also a stepfather to Ditzel's daughter from a previous relationship. The family moved to Boulder, Colorado in 2008, where they lived for four months, but returned to Southern California when his wife became pregnant. They settled in Bell Canyon, California, where Rogan had lived since early 2003. They purchased a new home in the area for almost $5 million in mid-2018. In 2020, the family moved into a $14 million home on Lake Austin, Texas. Rogan has vitiligo on his hands and feet. Rogan became interested in jiu-jitsu after watching Hoist Gracie fight at UFC 2, No Way Out, in 1994, as previously stated. In 1996, Rogan began training in Brazilian jiu-jitsu under Carlson Gracie at his school in Hollywood, California. He is a black belt under Eddie Bravo's 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu, a style of no-gi Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and a black belt in gi Brazilian jiu-jitsu under Jean-Jacques Machado. Rogan was raised Roman Catholic, having attended Catholic school in first grade, but has since abandoned following any organized religion and identifies as agnostic. In October 2019, during an episode of the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, Rogan confirmed that he is a cousin of My Chemical Romance lead vocalist Gerard Way, although they have never met. In January 2020, Rogan went on a carnivore diet for the entire month, only eating grass-fed elk, eggs, and vitamin supplements, such as amino acids and fish oil. As a result of this diet, Rogan said that he lost 12 pounds or 5.4 kilograms and said he experienced an increase in energy and relief from some prior health issues. However, Rogan admitted that this diet also negatively impacted his digestive system. In January 2022, Rogan announced that he would go on a meat and fruit diet for the entire month. Views, political positions. In 2020, CNN described Rogan as libertarian-leaning. Rogan has said that he holds a wide variety of political views and does not easily fall on any particular side of the political spectrum. He has described himself as socially liberal, saying that he supports same-sex marriage, gay rights, women's rights, recreational drug use, universal health care, and universal basic income, but also supports gun rights and the Second Amendment. Rogan describes himself as a strong supporter of freedom of speech and has criticized what he describes as cancel culture and what he perceives to be suppression of those who hold right-wing views in the television and film industry. He also criticized what he describes as an American foreign policy of military adventurism. Rogan endorsed Ron Paul in the 2012 U.S. presidential campaign and voted for libertarian candidate Gary Johnson in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. He endorsed Bernie Sanders during the 2020 Democratic Party presidential primaries, but ended up voting for Joe Jorgensen in the general election. Rogan has criticized political polarization in the United States and accused American liberals of hoping for former U.S. President Donald Trump to fail simply because because they disliked his persona. Rogan publicly supported Tulsi Gabbard and encouraged her to run for the U.S. presidency in 2020. On January 21st, 2020, Rogan said he would probably vote for Bernie Sanders in the 2020 Democratic primary, adding, he's been insanely consistent his entire life. Sanders was criticized by fellow Democrats for touting Rogan's endorsement during the 2020 presidential campaign, including by Move On, which referred to Rogan as someone known for promoting transphobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, racism, and misogyny. The Human Rights Campaign called on Sanders to reject Rogan's endorsement. 
After Sanders dropped out of the race, Rogan said he would rather vote for Trump than Biden, adding that I don't think Biden can handle anything. He claimed that he was concerned that Biden, who turned 78 shortly after Election Day, lacked the cognitive ability needed to run the United States and would not be able to handle the pressure of the presidency. Rogan criticized Biden for his verbal slip-ups, which he described as not a normal way to communicate unless you're high. Rogan has stated, Biden to me is like having a flashlight with a dying battery and going for a long hike in the woods. It's not going to work out. It's not going to make it. Donald Trump subsequently retweeted Rogan's comments on Biden's mental fitness. Rogan offered to moderate a four-hour debate with Trump and Biden in an effort to avoid what he referred to as media bias. Trump said he would be willing to do such a debate. A change.org petition was started to elect Joe Rogan as the moderator for the 2020 presidential debate, claiming that Rogan was qualified to handle the debates because he is nonpartisan. The petition received over 300,000 signatures. Rogan later revealed during a live election night podcast that he voted for libertarian candidate Joe Jorgensen. Drugs and spirituality. Rogan supports the legalized use of cannabis and believes it holds numerous benefits. He hosted the documentary film The Union, The Business Behind Getting High, and was featured in Marijuana, A Chronic History, and The Culture High. He also supports the use of LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, and DMT toward the exploration and enhancement of consciousness, as well as introspection. He was the presenter in the 2010 documentary DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Rogan has an interest in sensory deprivation and using an isolation tank. He has stated that his personal experiences with meditation in isolation tanks have helped him explore the nature of consciousness and improve his performance in various physical and mental activities and overall well-being. Other Views and Advocacy Rogan is an avid hunter and is part of the Eat What You Kill movement, which attempts to move away from factory farming and the mistreatment of animals raised for food. Rogan is opposed to routine infant circumcision and has claimed there is a lack of significant scientific evidence for any benefits to the practice, which he considers not entirely different from female genital mutilation because of its non-consensual nature. Rogan has been an outspoken critic of trans women competing with cisgender women in all forms of amateur and professional sports, including MMA matches. In April 2022, Rogan said that transgender swimmer Leah Thomas might be the woke straw that breaks society's camel's back. Controversies. Remarks on COVID-19. In April 2021, Rogan made contentious remarks about COVID-19 vaccines, in particular claiming that young, healthy people do not need to be vaccinated against the virus. This view was criticized by Anthony Fauci and White House Communication Director Kate Bedingfield, as well as by several media outlets. Part of the objection was that there have been notable cases affecting young, healthy people. Rogan acknowledged that there was some legitimate science behind Fauci's view and emphasized that he is not a doctor and should not be taken as a respected source of information. On September 1st, 2021, Rogan tested positive for the virus. Soon after, he released an online video reporting on the status of his condition and stating that he had begun a regimen including monoclonal antibodies, prednisone, azithromycin, NAD drip, and a vitamin drip, as well as ivermectin, a drug usually taken to treat parasitic infestations and not endorsed by the FDA as an effective treatment for COVID-19. This caused some controversy due to multiple people reportedly being hospitalized after self-medicating with an over-the-counter form of ivermectin designed to treat ailments in livestock, which typically has a significantly larger dosage. Rogan criticized CNN for describing ivermectin as a, quote, horse dewormer. Outpatient prescribing of ivermectin had recently increased significantly during the unproven claim that it's effective against COVID-19. The FDA called this trend disturbing. On September 3rd, 2021, Rogan tested negative for the virus. 
In January 2022, 270 scientists, physicians, professors, doctors, and healthcare workers wrote an open letter to Spotify expressing concern over false and societally harmful assertions, unquote, on the Joe Rogan experience and asked Spotify to, quote, establish a clear and public policy to moderate misinformation on its platform. Unquote. The 270 signatories took issue with Rogan broadcasting misinformation, particularly regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, unquote. And more specifically, quote, a highly controversial episode featuring guest star Robert W. Malone, number 1757. The episode has been criticized for promoting baseless conspiracy theories, including an unfounded theory that societal leaders have hypnoti hypnotized sorry, the public. The signatories further assert that Dr. Malone is one of two recent JRE guests who has compared pandemic policies to the Holocaust. These actions are not only objectionable and offensive, but also medically and culturally dangerous. Unquote. The signatories also note that Malone was suspended from Twitter for spreading misinformation about COVID-19. On January 24th, 2022, musician Neil Young posted an open letter threatening to remove his music from Spotify if they did not remove the podcast The Joe Rogan Experience from their service. The podcast, one of Spotify's most popular, has been criticized for spreading COVID-19 misinformation. Young wrote that Spotify has a responsibility to mitigate the spread of misinformation on its platform. On January 26th, Spotify removed Young's music. A spokesperson said Spotify wanted all the world's music and audio content to be available to Spotify users, and that it had a great responsibility in balancing both safety for listeners and freedom for creators. On January 29th, Joni Mitchell removed her catalog from Spotify in support of longtime friend and fellow polio survivor Neil Young and the global scientific and medical communities on this issue. Responding to the controversy, Rogan denied intentionally spreading misinformation and pledged to try to balance out these more controversial viewpoints with other people's perspectives, and said that he agreed with Spotify, adding a disclaimer to the beginning of his videos. Use of offensive language. Early in Rogan's stand-up career, fellow comedian Mehran Kagani complained that he unnecessarily used a gay slur in his act. Rogan said in a 2010 newspaper interview that sometimes it is the right word and that it is not a slanderous, evil, nasty word about homosexuals. Fellow comedian Sue Costello complained Rogan once followed her act at an L.A. club saying, who would ever f*** her with that accent, unquote, and simulating sex with her on stage. In February 2022, singer-songwriter India Ari Airy, sorry, shared a compilation of Rogan saying the racial slur N-word, not going to say that, on the Joe Rogan experience on Instagram. Rogan apologized, calling his past language regretful and shameful, while also saying that the clips were taken out of context, and he only quoted the slur to discuss its use by others. The footage in question was first published by the political action committee Patriot Takes, an affiliate of the liberal PAC Midas Touch. This resulted in allegations of a defamation attempt by Midas Touch, which the founders denied in an interview with Barstool Sports founder David Portnoy, instead attributing the source of the footage to Alex Jones, who was a recurring guest on Rogan's show. Rogan described the video compilation as a political hit job. Spotify had refused to carry 42 episodes of the podcast when it acquired the exclusive rights. Spotify says it spoke to Rogan about his history of using some racially insensitive language, and it says in an internal memo that Rogan selected 70 episodes, which were removed on February 4th, 2022, all of which predate the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's the end of it. Shout out to Just Mando. Just Mondo. Sorry. How do you say it? Mando? Just Mando? Uh, you requested this Rogan read, what, five, six times? And here we are. We finally did it. And it was a good one. I like uh, lear learning about I liked learning about this guy. This was really good. I have been a Joe Rogan fan since, yeah, it, it even said it right here. The very first episode was around 2009. When I would listen to him, I would go between him and Adam Carolla on my drives, long commutes, 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half. You wanted to drive that distance on Friday night rush hour. You were looking at, you know, two and a half hour drive. 
and Rogan's long form podcasts were pretty much the first podcasts that I, I began to listen to, like I said, along with Corolla. And I'd just been a fan ever since. So yeah, I've been listening since he and Red Band had that terrible audio at the very beginning and it's become what this is. And it's incredible to see how popular he's become. It sounds cliche even saying that, but uh, I'll dip in and out. Admittedly, I haven't listened as much since the YouTube to Spotify move just for convenience sake. I, I like to have YouTube on, but I do listen pretty frequently. I listened to the Lex Friedman one. James Hetfield was a great one. I loved the Dane Cook ones that he had. The Carrot Top one, which was fair, fairly recent, was really, really good also. There are so many good episodes. I mean, the Mr. Beast one. Anyway, yeah, big fan. Glad we actually got to read this. Let me know what else you guys want. Like and subscribe if you could, please. And, oh, trivia question? Um, Alright, see you guys soon. Talk to you in the comments. Bye. Biden, to me, is like having a flashlight with a dying battery and going for a long hike in the woods. It is not going to work out. It's not going to make... <laughs> That's f***ed up. Yeah, I gotta wait for a plane anyway. He has stated that his personal experiences with meditation in isolation tanks have helped him explore the nature of consciousness and improve his... And improve his... Mm, this is the hell of a f***ing sentence that I don't care about.